there's a big difference between knowing how to do ultrasound and knowing how to apply ultrasound. When it comes to applying ultrasound, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. Whenever you have to make a clinical decision, it's always helpful to have a process to guide you. So let's see how a process can help guide you with your ultrasound decisions. The first step in choosing to use ultrasound is to make sure you identify the diagnosis and any involved structures. It's impossible to know everything about every diagnosis in medicine. What's important in healthcare is that you acknowledge when you don't know something and make sure you go find that information out. It's also important to have a good understanding of the size and depth of the tissue that you intend to target with your ultrasound treatment. Secondly, it's important to identify where the patient is in the healing process and what the long-term prognosis is given their diagnosis. The information gathered in steps one and two will help guide the rest of the decision-making process. Third, we need to determine if ultrasound can actually help this patient achieve their goals. Ultrasound can be used to accelerate tissue healing, decrease pain, improve tissue extensibility, or deliver topical agents. If your patient can't benefit from any of these physiologic effects, then ultrasound might not be the right choice. Next and most importantly, we need to make sure there are no contraindications or precautions for the use of ultrasound. The presence of a contraindication means ultrasound should not be done under any circumstances. With a precaution, the clinician must use extra care when deciding if ultrasound is the appropriate treatment to apply. If you are unsure, then err on the side of safety and don't do ultrasound. Finally, after reviewing our clinical information and clearing our patient for precautions and contraindications, we need to determine our parameters. Decisions regarding parameters should be based on the patient diagnosis, the stage of healing, and the nature of our target tissue. So let's see how the process works for a few case studies. Case number one involves a 72-year-old female patient with left shoulder adhesive capsulitis. Symptoms have slowly increased over the past four months, and she presents with pain and lost motion. Her medical history is significant for insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus and high blood pressure. So our goal is to decrease pain and improve mobility. So our diagnosis is adhesive capsulitis. Adhesive capsulitis is a slow developing inflammatory condition of the shoulder joint capsule that leads to restricted mobility. So think about the location and depth of the shoulder joint capsule. The case also tells us that the pain and stiffness has been progressing for a four month period. Combined with our four out of 10 pain level would indicate this patient's not in an acute inflammatory state. So next we need to determine if ultrasound can provide any benefit for this particular patient. The use of thermal ultrasound has been shown to decrease pain and help improve tissue extensibility. Since these align with our clinical goals, ultrasound would be beneficial for this patient. Next we need to apply what we know about the patient's medical history and diagnosis to make sure there aren't any reasons we shouldn't be doing ultrasound. In this case, our patient has diabetes and hypertension, which are both controlled with medication. Hopefully it's becoming clear, if you don't understand these medical diagnoses, then you can't make the best decision regarding your patient in ultrasound. Some of the problems resulting from diabetes include retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Because a lack of sensation is a contraindication for ultrasound, I would have concerns about the neuropathy. Typically with diabetes though, the neuropathy tends to be peripheral, and in this case we're working on the shoulder, so it shouldn't be an issue. Since we're okay to go, we need to choose our parameters. Based on the information in the patient case, I would choose the following parameters, and here's why. I chose 1 MHz for frequency because we're targeting a deep tissue, our shoulder joint capsule. Based on our clinical goals, we've chosen to use thermal ultrasound. Therefore, I've chosen to do continuous ultrasound and start at 1.4 watts per centimeter squared for intensity. It's important to note that there's no one right choice for intensity. 1.4 watts per centimeter squared represents a starting point that may be adjusted during treatment. The same can be said for duration. As a guideline, you can treat twice the ERA of the ultrasound head in a five minute period. Since I've estimated my treatment area at 25 square centimeters, I've chosen seven minutes to start. It's important your duration is long enough to allow you to affect the target tissue appropriately. Let's look at another example. In this case, we have a 54-year-old male with complaint of right low back pain that resulted from an acute injury three weeks ago. 
He presents with pain 5 out of 10 and tenderness to palpation in the right erector spinae muscles between L1 and L5. Medications for our back pain patient include ibuprofen, which is an anti-inflammatory three times a day, and cyclobenzaprine once a day. Cyclobenzaprine is a muscle relaxer. With the exception of knee surgery 12 years ago, our patient's a generally healthy male. So for this case, we have a strain of our right lumbar erector spinae muscles. Keep in mind here that our muscles are deep to the latissimus dorsi and the thoracolumbar fascia. Based on the time and the patient's symptoms, we would assume he's transitioned into the proliferation phase. If there was more acute inflammation present, we would expect a higher pain level and more tenderness to palpation. So based on the information gathered so far, ask yourself, can ultrasound be of benefit for this patient? For this case, we have injured muscle tissue that is still in the early stages of healing. Since ultrasound can help accelerate tissue healing, it would be beneficial for this patient. As far as precautions and contraindications, there don't seem to be any for this particular case. Since our patient has transitioned out of the acute inflammatory phase, I would consider using thermal ultrasound. But since it's only been three weeks, I'll be cautious with the intensity I start with. Remember, the erector spinae are deep to other muscle groups. Therefore, I choose a frequency of 1 MHz to make sure I can penetrate to a larger depth. The more challenging component of this case is the size of the treatment area. Based on the estimation formula, it would take me roughly 15 minutes to treat an area this size. Although I could do ultrasound for 15 minutes, I might choose to focus on a more specific area. Further palpation might provide insight on the tissue that would benefit from the ultrasound the most. For this case, after we've reviewed the patient's history, take a moment to pause the video and see if you can answer our five questions. For case three, we have a 13-year-old female soccer player with a diagnosis of a grade two sprain of the medial collateral ligament of the left knee. The injury occurred seven days ago and the patient is currently wearing a brace and walking with crutches. The patient is currently taking Celebrex and has no other significant medical history. So at this point, let's have you pause the video do any research you need to on the diagnosis and the medications, and then answer our five key questions. Okay, let's compare notes and see what you came up with. As far as a diagnosis, a grade two ligament sprain is a moderate sprain, which generally takes about six to eight weeks to heal. Celebrex is a prescription strength anti-inflammatory and shouldn't have an impact on our decision making. The MCL is a very superficial structure and lies just beneath the skin on the medial knee. Since the injury was seven days ago, we're still in the inflammatory phase of healing. Therefore, I would choose to do non-thermal ultrasound. Ultrasound certainly would be beneficial to help facilitate healing of an injured ligament. The challenge in this case lies with our precautions. There are growth plates located at both ends on the femur. The only way to determine if a growth plate is open is through an x-ray. Growth plates typically close towards the end of puberty, which in this case for a female would be between the ages of 13 and 15. So for this particular case, I would only choose to use pulsed, low-intensity, non-thermal ultrasound. So based on the treatment tissue and precautions, these are the parameters I have chosen. You could also make the argument to pass on ultrasound based on your growth plate concerns. So we've included one additional case that you can use for discussion with your colleagues. This case involves a 77-year-old male patient who had a stroke two years ago. The stroke has left him with increased tone in his right lower extremity, which has led to an Achilles tendon contracture. The patient is able to ambulate by using a cane and an ankle foot orthosis. However, due to the Achilles tendon contracture, the patient's spouse now has difficulty getting his foot into the brace. So our therapy goals include improving right ankle dorsiflexion range of motion to allow him to wear his AFO. So, when deciding whether ultrasound is appropriate for this particular patient, run through your five questions and see where the information guides you. Always make sure to check for contraindications and precautions for the use of ultrasound. So let's go over a couple of points these cases have taught us. First, it's impossible to make good decisions about ultrasound without knowing your anatomy. Second, information in the medical history can have a significant impact on your ultrasound decision making. And finally, there is no one correct choice for parameters. The most important thing is that you have a rationale for the parameters you chose and can back them up with the facts of the case. It is our hope that taking you through a few cases has helped improve your confidence when it comes to making decisions regarding the use of ultrasound.